okay, this is Emmy Thomas. I just told you I'd give you three, two, one, and then I didn't give you three, two, one. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's go. I'm here with Kay today, and Kay, I'm going to ask you the question I always ask everybody, which is, what is it like to be you? Yes, ma'am. So for a long time, I didn't have a word for it. And I came across somebody who said a specific word and described how they are with this, and it clicked. It immediately hit me and I related. And that is uh, liminality. Neither here nor there, occupying two spaces at once in a permanent transition. And I feel like that is me with almost every facet of what I'm doing. And it's a very maddening area, but also it gives you so much clarity. So you can be here or there and navigate certain areas or, or whatever you're doing in front of you. And that is how I would describe being me. Interesting. So I used to not know the word liminal and until actually I learned it via law because there's what's called motions in limine, which... Uh, you know, li li limin limine maybe in Latin means like a threshold. Like it, mm -hmm. so it's like a threshold issue. So just as you're going to trial, it's like you know the days running up, leading up to trial. Then you have these particular motions, which are usually to either exclude or have particular pieces of evidence admitted into evidence. Uh, and I've I've often seen people like in the New Yorker say, oh, this person's good at like liminal spaces <laughs> or not good at liminal spaces, like in their narrative or whatever else. I do think that's a kind of interesting thing. So you say that you you associate with this this word because it suggests this like in-betweenness or yeah. not just the in-betweenness, but being both places at the same time. I would say fluid or dynamic, but yeah. sometimes it's not a good thing, right? Because you need to be in one place to to do something, and so it can it can it can bite you in the proverbial ass, right? But yeah. um, I I am think I am thankful that I can uh, I can define it because of that person. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. You know, one thing, and this is something I've been really struggling with today, is like I have uh, what one psychopath that I met, Arthur, if people want to look up his video, he calls it a chaos brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but does this um, have anything to do with chaos brain? Do you know what I mean by chaos brain? Yeah. So I used to call it ADHD plus. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely ADHD plus uh, with the uh, impulsivity and the uh, there's this there's this meme that I love um, or or scene in Rick and Morty. I don't know if you're familiar with that show. Yeah, Rick and Morty. So when he's running his uh, his um, uncursed shop where he's uh, taking item cursed items from the devil and removing the curses. And at the mm -hmm. end, he's met with all these responsibilities and he's bored and he's like, all right, I'm just going to blow the whole thing up and burn it down and everyone out. We're done. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. basically it. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I've seen that meme. I forgot mm -hmm. what it was, what the context was. He's like, I'm bored, done. Yeah. Yeah. The business just got real. Um, he it has responsibilities, and you know what? Screw this. It's boring now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get and out. People kind of think of that as a bad thing. You know, I was thinking recently. Uh, I did a podcast. Uh, recently, it probably will come out. I think it's called Fifty Fires. Probably come out in like six weeks or something. And I was talking to my friend who asked me to be on the podcast, and I. I was talking about like impulsivity and I said it the best way to describe though impulsivity uh, the way I'm thinking of it. Cause I think a lot of people think, you know, like why would Rick burn everything down and be like, I'm bored or whatever, like what, what is kind of going on in the mind. And so this is how I described it to him is that I also have this recurring dream in which I'm driving a car, but I'm in the back seat. So I'm like in the seat <laughs> behind the driver's <laughs> yeah. driver, whatever. I'm not at the wheel or whatever, but I'm like, okay, I'm driving and, you know, I need to figure out how to get to the front because I can't see anything. The seat's in front of me. It's blocking my view. I feel like I'm too close to the car in front of me, but I can't touch the brakes. Like, how am I driving this car at all if you know I'm in the back like? seat? Hmm. That sounds like you're occupying two spaces at once. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. Tell me the back how? seat and the driver and the driver's oh. seat. <laughs> but that's how it feels is like, I'm mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, if I, if I'm not being impulsive, then it's like, I'm in the driver's seat. It, it feels like I'm connected and kind of in control. If I'm acting in kind of an impulsive way, it feels like, okay, sure. That's kind of me, 
but like I'm not really in control. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Who knows what's happening? I know that's exa I exactly. I relate to that very much. So, um, <laughs> my when it comes to impulsivity, mine definitely relies on uh, emotion. As soon as I'm getting a rush of 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 good emotions, I'll do it. Or or if I'm on the uh, other end of that, uh, you know, rage. Yeah, rage. I've learned to cope with. By removing myself from the situation, it took me years to 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 learn this and actually calm down, reassess, and come back. Mm -hmm. um, it, it never got to a point to where it was just vile, um, but it definitely showed its ugly head in ways that made me want to grow as a person and not do that again. Mm -hmm. um, but it it took some pain to go through that. But <laughs> uh, I could share a little story about the the opposite, and that one is the the. Uh, <laughs> The emotions of rushing in, into something because you're you're so up in the moment. Um, I was um, going on a date with a woman, and she proposed as a joke, I think, or whatever, that we go swim with sharks. Um, and I said, "Are you serious? Don't tempt me with a good time." Mm -hmm. um, she said, "Yeah, let's go. Uh, I'm free this day. I'm free that day. I booked it." I said, "We're swimming uh -huh. with sharks," and she ghosted me. <laughs> no way. Yeah, she ghosted me. She's she was probably just like joking around or whatever. Or I don't know. But oh I'm like, if you're gosh. serious, if you're serious, I'm going to do that. And I was so I was disappointed. But after like a couple of days of reflecting on it, I'm like, OK, <laughs> maybe I should have just confirmed some more things. But still, I was just caught up in it. I wanted to swim with sharks with a stranger who might have pushed me in front of it. I didn't care. I wanted to do this. It sounded cool. This is a um, crazy story to me. Number one, I don't understand ghosting. I don't feel like I've ever ghosted somebody. I've always just been like. I don't know. It, it seems like said you're disregarding somebody's personhood. It seems like if you, I don't know, it seems like a very aggressive thing to do. Do you feel that way about ghosting? Um, No, I see it as more of like passive aggressive or even just uh, being um, not aggressive. The opposite. You're actually, it's, it's cowardice. You're not actually dealing with the, the uh, your emotions properly and communicating. I don't mean to sound so harsh, but yeah, it might be I think like a generational thing. <laughs> like I, I view, maybe. I mean, I, I view it as more of like, you know, you, you can't you don't have the balls to say, I don't want to do this. This this was stupid. Um, uh, and you're just going to to cower down and just stop talking to that person. But uh, it kind of seems like people are like like that. That's kind of like an OK thing to do. Like, oh, no, ghosting somebody, somebody is something that's you're well within your right to do. And I guess. It, sure, I mean, you're well within your right to do it and nobody's going to arrest you or something, but like it sure. just seems like such a toxic it, thing to it do. Is. It is. And I, I'm guilty of it, too. I don't do it often, but I am guilty of it. Right. Hmm. But um, I do look at myself being not a, I, I'm going to be a hypocrite. I wouldn't say I was like, being a coward. Then I was just being selfish. But <laughs> I, I, I just stopped communicating with some people because I just didn't I, I didn't care. I was done with with whatever was happening. Yeah. Um, but um but yeah yeah that i mean was... i never kind of communicate with people because i feel like i have to but i'll just be like i can't i can't talk to you right now yeah no i, I understand that there's there's some people in my life that require more communication mm -hmm. um to, to to keep that relationship going and i understand mm -hmm. that and that's kind of like that that agreement the, un, the unspoken agreement type of deal um but, unspoken uh, agreement that um like hey I, I need to at least say hi once a week <laughs> uh, yeah. To, to, Social to, to, contract. Yeah, yeah. One of those. I mean, we we all have one of those friends. At least I think we do. Or some some sort of weird uh, situation. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So uh, with those people, though, I don't. Especially nowadays, I try not to do things kind of for like artificial reasons, where I'm just like putting on an act. So I, I have to then psych myself up and be like, okay. You know, let's try to remember this person. Who are they to you? Why do you care? <laughs> and if fair. I can't psych myself up, then I'll just be like, no, then I just need to cut cut them free. <sighs> Set me free. Why don't you be? You know that song? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm sorry. But I do understand what you're saying. That There are some people in my life that have a deeper meaning than that. But I can mm -hmm. see general like relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I can see what you mean by that. I mean, I'm not saying do or don't. I'm not. I don't mean to be judgy about it. No, I, I, I'm not getting that at all. I'm. I'm just okay. telling you from my end. Um, 
my end of that. No, but I but I understand where you have to constantly keep them on your mind to 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 actually remember, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I get hard. that. Yeah. I totally understand that. I really do. Um, yeah. Yeah, because out of sight, out of mind. Yes, one hundred percent. It's so hard. And it what really sucks is when you actually do care about that person. But for me, ADHD gets out of whack. Uh, and it's not like I don't care about them. It's like I'm busy or just things are happening, right? Right. Yeah, that is the hard thing because then you end up kind of ruining something or hurting this, them. And like you're like, oh, this that's when you think, okay, this is a disorder. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. There's, there's some things that I'm... I would like to think I'm well adjusted with, and then I'll completely forget about this. And then I'll do this thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's probably not the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll come, I'll come back to like, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that exists. Yeah. I mean, that probably like my impulsivity was that the most to me, like a, a reminder, like, why did I just do that? Like wake up with like, <laughs> post nut clarity or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and just be like what happened there what was i doing Oof. yeah dare i say shame no yeah there's some for some of that on my end there's a little embarrassment for some of the things not not a whole bunch but n yeah yeah i want to say that yeah that post nut clarity can hit you pretty hard <laughs> well it's not even like I mean, like the stuff that like is the weird parts of impulsivity, they're not even things I wanted to do, not yeah. even things I had thought about doing. They're not <laughs> even things <laughs> like they weren't. It wasn't like this big temptation that I finally gave into. It was just like random. It was like, did somebody just roll the dice or whatever and think, OK, this is like now we mm -hmm. have to do some like some weird Black Mirror episode <laughs> in which I'm being somehow controlled you know, by <laughs> random occurrences halfway around the world. That's how it feels like there's such a distance between like those those moments and and th thinking I don't even recognize myself in those memories. Yep. And that could have happened yesterday, a week ago or last year. And you're like, wow, what? who is this person? I, I completely relate with that. That's that's <laughs> yeah, that that's that's actually refreshing to hear, to be honest. Yeah. I've been thinking recently about impulsivity, though, because it's kind of like what you say or said earlier when you have a good feeling and you just go with it and you have a negative feeling. Often, I think people just think of impulsivity as being the negative feeling thing, but it's really the good feeling thing, too. And mm -hmm. so I was talking. Whoa, you went total like munchkin. Do you represent the lollipop guild? Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. And that was weird. weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, yeah. So people normally think of like just the negative impulsivity and not the positive. But, I, you know, talking again to this friend about this podcast, because the podcast is like about money or something. I said that I had fully funded my retirement by the time that I was 30. Right. And and like what was the motivation for doing that was mostly just like an impulse. Like I just got like so kind of fixated on the idea of compound interest and thinking like if I just put like this amount of money, like twenty five thousand dollars, if I just like put it in the stock market for 40 years, then I'll have a million dollars. And that's the easiest way to get a million dollars is just to put it in the stock market for 40 years and then it comes out a million dollars. Uh, so I got hyper fixated on kind of this concept. And so that that to, to do that, to just be like, oh, I'll just write a check to Fidelity, you know, open up at a, a traditional Roth account or something was an impulsive decision, you know, but it was like a really good decision. And it's was in it some though? ways. Was it, it not? impulse or did you it think was, about it? I was or just... were you, have you been thinking about it for years and, you know, you just forgot about it. And then now you just had a great execution and timing you know i've actually caught myself in that where i'm like you know i've actually thought about this for seven years and right now is a good timing to do this and i want to impulsively do it but it really was well thought out but oh. was it 
See, that's kind of what I mean is like an impulse doesn't necessarily have to be kind of bad or even something that wasn't like something you thought about before. I guess it just means like you've done something quickly without like really taking the time to think it through or like, you know, be kind of so meticulous about it. I I did this recently, so I can have it in recent memory, where I just went all out on artificial intelligence, specifically oh. large language models. I built a mini data center in my in my apartment, um, where I'm inferencing inferencing and training uh, language models, and I did it out of impulse. I just I learned how to to just assemble the machine, liquid cool the graphics cards, and I bought uh, decommissioned uh, graphics accelerator cards and. I learned how to do all of this out of impulse and hyperfixation, hmm. and yeah. over over the course of two years. And I also kind of made some money from doing it too. And it was just a hyperfixation. Almost every waking moment, I was just like, "I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to get this to get this." And also, I started a business, which is yeah, mildly successful. I'm not going to say it, but it was out of a hyperfixation, out of a positive emotion of an impulse. And then mm-hmm. I've done that, like all, all, all my impulses mainly come from positive emotions, just, really? just going for it, hyperfixation, go, go get shit done mentality. But it has <laughs> caused a lot of pain in my life because I've neglected things that, um, including myself, I've missed out on, on experiences that looking back uh, probably would have been beneficial if I just chilled out. Mm-hmm. So the way I can, the analogy that I like to use to describe this is that I'm always climbing mountains. And then before I reach the peak to enjoy the view, the fruits of my labor, I immediately jump to the next mountain to climb. If I'm not struggling, I don't have satisfaction. Mm. I don't think it's more of like, like some sort of masochist thing, but it's more of like, if I'm not achieving something, I don't get satisfaction. And when I achieved it, it's like, okay. So becoming aware of this fairly recently actually has helped me understand that aspect of my life and allowed me to calm down and really focus on now instead of ultra like now and then maybe in the future and don't even caring like also considering what I'm doing at this moment and how it's going to affect my future. It's, it's a different sort of like in the now, if that makes sense. Yeah, tell me what the difference is. So when you're hyper focused, you're you're you have these goals that you set, but you're also just really hyper focused on that goal. When you're also considering where that goal is going to take you and considering the future of that goal, the bigger picture, while you're also living in the moment, that's what I'm talking about. It's not fully a big picture, but it's more, in my opinion, a healthier way of, of, of looking at it because you can step back from that hyperfixation and say like, okay, no, I need a break from this. I can't spend eight hours a day on this and then, uh, or also have a full-time job. I can't, I can't do this and have relationships. I need to actually take time and, 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 and look at all these other aspects of my life that I'm neglecting or have neglected in the past. Is it just like you're, you're, uh like taking a step back like you're toggling between the hyperfixation yes. okay yes yes um absolutely absolutely and i don't know how this happened entirely it just it happened more recently a whole lot of personal growth happened recently within the past year that it's more that's happened 5 years for me really and a part of and a part of that is actually discovering uh psychopathy to be honest the iron the ironic bit of that is that it's actually quite helped me uh define some areas of my life where i'm like what is happening you know um and especially when it comes to what, the hardest part of that was accepting that i'm not a monster right because if you look online about this thing um psychopathy is is probably the 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 most gentle form of actually easing someone into it if you're on yeah. youtube Oh, you're a monster. You're going to destroy this person. Oh, if you're on Google, oh, you're a monster. No, not necessarily. Because if you were, you probably would be dead or in prison. So um, just to pause and plug like more, more overtly, psych- psychopathy is dot org, right? Is correct. Is this correct. nonprofit. Yeah, correct. Correct. Absolutely. Just just to clarify that. Absolutely. Um, I'm I am a fan. Personally, there's some in my social group who aren't. Um, 
and they have their disagreements, but I do, I do, I do uh, agree with their work because of uh, the destigmatization and they're actually, you know, putting work and effort into like, you know, <laughs> actually saying, no, these people, um, they exist and they're not monsters and, and they're trying to actually do work in that, in that regard. I, I admire that because you know, me, sorry, go ahead. And, and like, because I am on the advisory board or whatever, I've sat through some of these meetings where they basically just say they're trying to do for psychopathy and for psychopaths kind of what autism speaks is, I believe, the nonprofit that like since the 80s is yeah. has been re largely responsible <laughs> for yeah. like elevating the understanding and awareness. And with the understanding and awareness Sure. Yeah, we didn't know everything about autism in the 80s. That was clear. You know, people were like, it's basically a death sentence or whatever, you know, uh, not a death sentence, but a relationship death sentence, maybe for if your kid got diagnosed with autism, you didn't expect them to have any sort of form of, you know, whatever wow. life that you could recognize. Uh, <clears throat> but the one of the problems that they've kind of assessed is like, if, if it's kind of hidden in the shadows, then you also don't get like any funding or research <laughs> money to understanding it. Absolutely. You know, so it's not like they're trying to promote an agenda or a perspective. It's more like they're trying to just say, Hey, look at this psychopathy is, you know, it exists and, and we need to understand it better. And we need to kind of put more resources uh, and devote a little bit more time to understanding it. Absolutely. You know, the ironic bit about that is that I think that people who are on that spectrum deserve a lot of empathy and understanding because they are very vulnerable. Um, because of, are. Yes. Very. Uh -huh. <laughs> the irony is they're very vulnerable. They're very sensitive. <laughs> I mean, there, there are moments in my life to where someone just pissed me off in a way and I'm just, I'm just being sensitive. I want to call it that. Yeah, I was being sensitive. And I just, out of spite, just not like, total seek and destroy that person's life but just i was i was a for lack of a better term i was a dick right i, I didn't do any crazy damage but i was just being a jerk to them i was i was being uh unempathetic um if there's resources for for that you know like even adhd right in in media and everything they're all like oh this hyperactive squirrel guy who's on like caffeine who can't sit in his chair still well no there's there's more to it than that it has a lot of overlap with autism a mm, lot actually mm -hmm. yeah. but there, there there's some you know differentiate you know it differentiates uh, a lot and like for example routine i would li i like routine but i also get bored with it and want to mess it up <laughs> a little bit um yeah. where where someone who who's on that spectrum the autism autistic spectrum they need routine to soothe right um I like to, you know, maybe take a different route to work every once in a while, maybe even show up late because I've been on time too much or, or, or even no call, no show because yeah, why not? I don't know. I just like, I, I, I'm, I'm bored, you know, I want some little spice in my life occasionally. Um, but there's, there's the hyper fixation bit, you know, that overlaps. There's, there's the attention to detail, some, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of overlap, which is actually quite interesting. And if you look at the the research, I can't specifically quote studies, um, but if you look at the research, the um, the brain between a psychopathic brain and, and a person with ADHD, it, <laughs> the it's quite interesting the the, the similarities there. And mm. I, I I really hate to do a disservice by not actually quoting you know facts and like the like the amygdala is smaller or whatever I think it is, but I don't want to mis misrepresent. But I would I highly recommend people googling that. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting yeah it's it's a really interesting kind of it is a puzzle like psychopathy is a puzzle because i guess there are a couple kind of like paradoxes i can think kind of right <laughs> away about it like a hyper fixation but like an inability to focus <laughs> you know like, so if uh, you actually if you actually take that out like if you remove the word psychopathy someone will be like adhd hmm <laughs> It's just it's it's that underlying hum sometimes that paranoia from I think it's ADHD and then it's probably the trauma that it introduced to paranoia and other things that make you think that this person might be insidious initially. Mm -hmm. So like I won't be navigating something and I'll think what is this person's angle? What are they doing to get at me? Maybe this this and I'll set things in motion that if it goes either way that I will come out on top.
I will have the desirable outcome. And that can be inherently insidious, but I'm doing it to, out of a protection of myself because of previous experiences and trauma. Yeah, it's a that's defense how, mechanism. Exactly. And so that's how I perceive it. That's that's my lived reality. And sometimes yeah. um, when I'm doing it, it's actually painful because I'm doing it with someone that I care about, that I actually have a deep relationship with, be it my 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 relatives, siblings, or someone I care about. And the cognitive dissonance that it induces is quite, quite maddening. But also in that madness, there is enjoyment because there's feeling in it. It's it, that that in itself is a different topic. But so you're uh, when you kind of are doing it to some somebody you love, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like um, orchestrating like machinations or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, you there's like this cognitive dissonance where you're like, I am hurting this person. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. You feel you are you saying you feel a little bit of pleasure in the hurt that you feel because you're like, well, that must mean I care about the person, I yeah. guess. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, so something that I've noticed about myself is that my psychopathic traits are elevated when I feel like I'm out of control of my life. When I've settled resolution or sorry, when I've resolved conflict uh within myself internally a lot of that settles and it just, and it's just ADHD. I mm -hmm. become well adjusted to a point to where I can maintain my life. Um, when I'm out of control, when I feel out of control, when I feel pressured from, from areas where I'm going to feel like I'm in danger. No, I immediately go to unempathetic in defense and attack mode and Machiavellianism. Yeah. The whole, the whole nine yards. And I try to remove, like I'm at a point in my life where I try to remove myself out of those situations. I try to be an adult about it, lack of a better term. I don't put myself in those situations or or I remove myself from those. Well, how does boredom then fit in that paradigm? Because Ooh, if you, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um I, like I said, when I'm in a routine, I kind of like to just I don't know how you are about censoring, but uh, I just like to fuck it up. I mean, I, I I'm sorry. But I, I, do you see? Do you see a little <laughs> bit like the paradox of what you it's, said? You're I, like, uh, yeah. When stuff is chill, you're mm -hmm. like less psychopathic. But if it's too chill, then you yeah. like to fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's very, it's very uh, too spacey, you know. Two spaces mm -hmm. at once, mm -hmm. always. I I hate that, but I love it. <laughs> uh, the cognitive dissonance is what I love. I love irony. I find that the purest form of humor. I just laugh about it sometimes, even at my own detriment. Uh, why? What is pure humor about irony? Um, because it's ironic. Okay. <laughs> Psychopaths being unempathetic, uh, predatory, but they're also the most vulnerable and sensitive. Right. Uh, the irony in that is hilarious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I just find that funny. Um. It's it's pro it's probably part of my maddening condition, where like the most negative trait I can probably think of is that like, um, out of it I find the irony the most humorous, and that can be, that can be very callous, I guess, you know, especially uh, when I'm trying to. One 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 underlying hum of mine, um, is that and something that I've had to actually consciously make an effort towards is that someone else's mind is not my toy. I know. Yeah. that's a hard one um it's it's not as like insidious as that sounds it's not like some sort of you know psyops that i'm deploying on someone's mind but it's more of like um practical jokes um james fallon said best because i have siblings i can relate to it you, you view yourself as big brother and the person you're messing with is little brother and you're just teasing them but you don't realize that you're hurting them yeah that's 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 my lived reality and sometimes i can go too far and that empathy deficit causes that person to hurt. And I don't mean that. Um, I actually caught myself earlier this morning. Someone who <laughs> confides into me. I wasn't messing with them, but the empathy deficit made me give them the truth too deliberately and, and harsh toward mm. hurt them. And I was looking back at it. And I'm like, yes, that's solid advice. Yes, they need to hear it, but they don't need to hear it like this right now at this moment because they're under pressure. Oh, and uh, it kind of put them in a dark place. That's where yeah. that can also get me into trouble as well, because I, I don't I don't have the patience for, for that sort of stuff. So do you think you did that to kind of like to provoke them? Like, were you like, I'm going to give them a harsh truth or I, it, I, it, 
I try not to go down that train of thought um, because then you can go into some sort of maddening loop, feedback loop of, did I really do this? You, and you start losing that trust within yourself. So what I like to do is to look at my actions and not what my thoughts are and say, okay, were my actions pure and good and intent? And if they were, then yes, that's what it was. It was, it was good intent. Um, there was, there was no underlying hum with this. That's nothing. Because if I continue with that thought, I'm going to overthink, I'm going to go myself into some crazy stir and then it's going to bring up more negative traits. So I try to huh. cap it. I just like, no, no, stop. Bad K, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So like you, when kind of, uh, re or assessing after the fact, some of your actions, you say that you can kind of get like um, caught up and thinking about it and that itself will lead to more kind of negative yes. actions. Yes, it always does. It always does. I always look at the angles. I always do this. I always overanalyze. And then it becomes oh. like this person may be trying as a threat in a way. And then. Oh, I see. So yeah. you start by feeling kind of badly for the person. And then at uh -huh. the end, you're like, actually, it was that person's fault. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny. Something... Sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Well, so I, I, uh, I read this book. You know, it's written by I think like a BYU professor, philosophy professor, called "Bonds That Make Us Free," and it's about self deception, and it's really interesting. You know, uh, and people who are in, you know, interested or like, especially people who deal with people who are self deceived, like narcissists or something. I think it's a really eye opening book. But one of the things that he kind of warns about is some for certain people, <laughs> if they have wronged you, then they, they do exactly this thing where it's like they will they cannot that that kind of cognitive dissonance, whatever. They can't kind of just be like, I made a mistake and, you know, I'll move on. But they, they have to now make it seem like you deserved it. <laughs> like because in in their mind they're the good guys so i always mm -hmm. kind of joke around with my siblings that the last thing that you want to do is have our dad like wrong you you know because if he's like wronged you you know if he's like you know slighted you or did something kind of bad to you then he will hyper fixate on you <laughs> Um, and like become obsessed with you until he's kind of like painted you out to be some like crazy villain, you know, who had to be like taken out for the good of the community or whatever. <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, not like that. I can, I can, I can understand if someone were to wrong me in certain cir circumstances, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's I okay. So full disclosure, I have a clean record. Um, <laughs> I I don't have a history of violence. But if someone wrongs me in a specific way that's threatening to my livelihood or that my family, I would definitely pursue them. Okay. <laughs> so that, with that being said, um, because of trauma in my past, I definitely have that seek and destroy mentality. Mm. Um, it, like an assessed threat. And it, it, it definitely is something that I try to keep a cap on. Um, hmm. because I'm prone to road rage, but not oh. like, oh God. Uh, uh, okay. So not like I'm going out and someone cut me off type of deal, but more like if someone cut me off, break checked me, give me the finger, I will escalate, but I'll <laughs> put them in a position that if they escalate further, it puts themselves in danger. Oh, so I, I, I will definitely pull the strategy of like that. And if they do that, then I'm like, okay, that was your choice. I'm completely washed hands clean. We're good. Um, so I have to really watch that because if I get into that mentality, that can put me in a position to where I'm doing something I may regret later or hurt someone. Mm. And cause like at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? Right. That, that happened. But in the moment that impulsivity takes the wheel. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. It reminds me of uh, my girlfriend, Aria kind of experiences stuff like this a little bit where it's very like seek and destroy and some of the stuff now that we've been like together for like quite a bit, sometimes she'll do it when she perceives like a slight against me. <laughs> and yeah. It's like seek and destroy. And I'm like, nobody needs to be destroyed. Nobody needs to be sought. Everything. Spider-Man's just fine about this. Uh, but yeah, I, I, she calls it like shadow Aria. She's like, uh Oh, <laughs> shadow um, Aria is coming out. And I'm like, does she need to come out? You know, what is she, what is she doing here? So I, I understand that to an extent. 
when it comes to interpersonal relationships, that's inhibited to a fault. Mm. Absolutely to a fault to where someone could take advantage of me. Oh, interesting. Um, so when it comes to like interpersonal relationships with like siblings, partners, or or family, that space for me is reserved and is sacred. And to where it could be a codependent relationship, and I've had it in the past, to where I am the person who sues that person and I am a source of their happiness. Mm. And that's bitten me in the ass a couple times. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to anyone else where I'm not able to establish that deep connection, sorry, you can go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm kind of, it's very hard for people who are in that space to see that side of me. But there's been situations where like, wow, this, I'm going to sound like an ass. I've had a, a boss come in um, and talk about his his child who's dying of leukemia. And they're talking about it. They're crying. And I'm like, okay, I just wanted to get done with the spreadsheet. Got you done. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I really, I'm sorry, but I really need it. I, I, don't, I don't care. Mm. But I'm not saying that to them. I'm thinking that, right? Even though they're crying in front of me, it's just that 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 sort of space isn't reserved. Yeah, I wish I could have that space. But I mean, it is what it is. I'm not unempathetic to a point of where I dismiss them, but I definitely probably am not giving that all what someone else would, right? When you say with like your your close close people and you say that you do it to a fault, why do it to a fault? Why not just do it to not a fault? I don't know. I'm still working on that. That's part of my journey still. I it, At least I am uh, able to uh, to be aware of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um. It's it's a it's a boundary issue apparently, um, but apparently, I am, I, I am working I am working on it. I could have been conditioned this way. It could be because of trauma. Who knows? I'm still working mm-hmm. on it. Um, unfortunately, therapists don't like working with me. They're 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 either like, uh, "Have you manipulated anyone today?" or like, "No," or 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 they're like, "We don't deal with people with your type of trauma," and it's, so it's very hard for me to find help in that regard. Why? I mean, I don't. You, please don't respond with specifics that you don't want to share but like what what is the thing that scares them about working with you i guess my past if you know um hmm? so i i try to be open and honest when i'm like when i'm in with a mental health professional i want help right i want to I, I identified a problem and i want to i want to assess it i want to fix it i want to get shit done and i go all out and i tell them everything oh and at that point, they're like, oh, okay, guy. No, no, no. Uh, sorry. Um, a lot of it is, 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 uh, so when I was younger, I externalized a lot of, of lack of control. Um, and I was fortunate, but also unfortunate in the way I did that. I was never caught. And so I when s- you say externalize, <laughs> I think I know like the psychology speak, it means that you're acting out kind of. Yes. Yeah. Um, like most teenagers will egg a house or a car or throw tea, you know, I, I, mine was more related with hacking. Okay. And I knew how to finesse it to where like I can go and jump borders and the, the red tape would prevent me from ever being caught. Mm-hmm. I never did anything so bad to where it was hurting someone in a regard of like financial or, or even losing someone's job. But I definitely didn't care where I got into. Mm-hmm. I definitely didn't care about the the boundaries because that sort of power where you can manipulate machinery and bend it to your will and also get into anywhere you want to be is so hard to give up, especially when you lack that internally and with yourself. Yeah. Um, I was lucky that I never faced the consequences of my actions, but I was also unfortunate because I never learned early on and I probably would have expedited. Yeah. Having a record would definitely set me back for where I want to be now. But uh, mm-hmm. probably would have helped me, maybe. I don't know. Um, would have helped you need... because you would have had to, like, confront? Yes. Yeah, I would have I to see. been responsible. I probably would have had to have, I would have expedited a lot of healing processes, maybe have gotten the help I needed to 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 do this this thing or that thing. Um, hmm. But um, I don't regret it because a lot of the skills I learned doing that, I use today to make a living. <laughs> Um, not in a hacking way, but that mindset of tinkering, understanding how things work and, and, you know, getting it done, you know, um, that sort of mindset definitely made me a a success today. At least I think so. Um, Hmm. so it's, it's very interesting. 
So you've been successful outwardly, but you you haven't been kind of forced, I guess, to deal with at least you weren't forced earlier to deal with some some of the reasons, some of the underlying reasons that were being externalized, I guess, by this exactly. behavior. Yeah. Exactly. I'm dealing with that now, right? But um it's definitely a journey. And I, I do want to preface that I've never hurt anyone personally, at least to the point of where like I think that <clears throat> It damaged them or traumatized them. I, I definitely got into some places where it made people freak out, but it was funny as heck. But <laughs> but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> but that was when I when I say okay, so we're gonna go back to the original question. When I say that in therapy, they immediately go, "You don't know where I live, right?" Like, no, I don't mm-hmm. even care to find out. I don't know that that's not I me. I see. Um, so I become a threat, but also um the one thing that took me out of that world, the one thing that I opened my eyes, uh, I turned 18, right? And I'm, uh-huh. like, okay, I'm like, okay, I can actually be liable for a lot of this stuff. But then um, some of my friends who I used to run with uh, either uh, killed themselves through overdoses because mental health issues run rampant in that community, obviously. Yeah. Or they were arrested and made an examples of because the Obama administration really cracked down on cybercrime. Oh, so interesting. Either, either you died or you were got arrested. And I'm like, you know what? If I continue down this path, this is what's going to happen. Um, I had that insight, which is very uh, unpsychopathic, right? <laughs> but um, I, I could see where I was going to walk. And that's what really took me out. Not morals, not this, not that. It was like, okay, that, that's the outcome. Because it, ha- it was happening so frequently with that that generation of 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 those people I was associating with, so mm. I'm like, okay, so this is this is gonna this is my inevitable outcome. Yeah. And so just because you saw like saw the way things were gonna be, then you just stopped. Well, I mean, I was kind of forced to see it. Uh, I, I was like, maybe I started out with like let's say 15 people I used to run with, and I was left with three. Mm. That that kind of that kind of uh, you know proverbial like sticking the dog's nose and the poop in the living room floor is kind of kind of overt, right? <laughs> Man, I have to do that with myself sometimes, where I'm like, "You keep making the same mistake. <laughs> like, yeah. stop making the same mistake." I rub my own like nose in the poop and be like, "Stop, mm-hmm. stop doing this." I, I don't want to reveal my age, but if mm-hmm. you if you knew it, you would be like, okay, so that makes sense of where you, you I think of your reference as the playground. Oh um, yeah, playground. I'm at the end of that. Okay. Um, I, I'm at the end of that. So, yeah, looking back, that 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 sort of that life crisis of going, wait, why am I not where I wanted to be? That grandiosity of being this person. Wait, a oh, minute. what's happening? Yeah. So, do you know you know the playground? Do you know the reckoning? Have you ever heard anything about the reckoning? Oh God, you're gonna do some anxiety. Go ahead. I want to hear it. Let's go. I want this chaos. Let's go. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> well, I'm just curious because uh, <laughs> sometimes sometimes people like in in my kind of like cycle of a psychopath, <laughs> uh-huh. like there's really only two two kind of cycle stages that like stand out with anything with any degree of like being able to recognize well and one of them's playground and then usually the reckoning follows and the reckoning is like just a, a time in which people like you know reckon with within themselves okay who am i and yep yep that i'm there yep okay that's me that's so, me right now all right yep so he's you're... raising his hand yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's me. How long have how long have you been kind of? Uh, it sounds like maybe the past year or something. Yeah, past year, yeah. past year, and I found a group of like-minded individuals, and they helped me through my journey a lot. I am very much appreciated of them, um, because you know you're not going to find that anywhere else. You you're not. You're so I read find your book. What? Oh, that that sort of relation. Okay. Like somebody being able to understand you. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like what we're doing now. Right. So <laughs> that, that sort of relation, right. You could talk through like, yeah, I've been there. This is what happened, you know, and you can be like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was one person in my life who I could do that early on with relate with like, like we were a twin almost. He was my, they were my best friend. Um, And several years ago, they did something that 
really shook me to the core that honestly probably started me down this journey the um, reckoning jerry and me the, the reckoning the reckoning uh -huh. because i could relate to them so well and they did something so vile oh really it made me look introspective um but it caused so much pain when they did it because they took the lives of several people very close to me and the way they described that event was so cold and I could relate to the words, but I could not relate to the brutality, the actions, and the echoing pain that still exists today. Yeah. I can't relate to that. And so that caused so much chaos and turmoil within within myself. I'm like, wait a minute. This is the one person that I could relate to as a child going through, you know, all the way to adulthood. We were best friends. And I can see the pain they caused and, and all of this. And then that happened, and I'm like, okay what i don't want to be really dark or weird but i can i can see the steps it would take to be that vile okay. i would never want to be that person and that's that was the issue that was the issue um so, so you were afraid because you saw yourself in this person a little bit that yes. they had done this thing and you were worried yeah i mean when you when you see that and I honestly, when I say that's the only person I could truly connect to as like, like we are now and in, in a way of relating as, as like, like shared perspectives. Yeah. If that happens, man, that, that shakes you to the core, right? Yeah, that is crazy. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like yeah. shit, shit, man. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like you seeing your hacker friends, you know, die or, or go to prison. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, making the same mistake twice, I guess, but more than once. I don't know. Um, I know at my core, I, I'm not that person. Um, because I do value human connection. I do when it can happen, and I strive for it. And I do love to love, and I do put a lot of effort in being a decent human being. And it took a while for me to 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 find myself and to reconcile that and resolve that it took a long time so i mean kind of listening to this and and feel free to answer as narrowly as you want but like why are you concerned why do you put a lot of effort into being a decent human being because i don't want to cause the pain that that person caused me and to mm. other people right i mean I, I don't want even want to take it to the extreme, but also it's like, if you think about it, like if I look back at all my life choices and how I treated people, I was pretty vile in certain ways. I can, I can justify it or whatever, but I would love to believe I never traumatized anyone, but I probably did mm -hmm. in a certain way. And it's kind of hard to reconcile when you're going through the reckoning because then you have to answer for a lot of things. And either you mm -hmm. be a better person, you be a man, you be a woman, you 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 own it, or you continue being vile and you stagnate. And I do not want to stagnate because then you rot. And when you okay. rot, you, you attract other things that like rot. Yeah. And I yeah, don't that's interesting. Do that. I'm trying to think <laughs> how to ask kind of this question. So you say you don't want to cause trauma to other people. And I do think your answer is, is like very good about like, you don't want to stagnate. You don't want to rot, but why, you know, you, you don't have to stag, you know, like the opposite of stagnate isn't necessarily, let's say to the good to the light <laughs> you could also it's not like a zealot, you know get right? darker I'm, darker I'm, darker that's no, no, also no. lack of stagnation not, i understand what you're saying no it's not like swing the pendulum and then hold it on one side type of deal no it's it's more so finding a balance of peace inner peace and that's not at all what i'm saying actually I'm oh like okay curious. okay yeah. sorry <laughs> clarify please please clarify well i just am wondering because like uh you know where where does this urge to not traumatize people come from Okay. Like what is um, what is the aesthetic that like underlines that? Because I've been traumatized by multiple people. I see. Uh -huh. A lot of people. By brutality, by violation, by murder, by I mean, I've I've sampled the whole trauma board, smorgasbord, board, if you want to call it that. Um it's pretty it's pretty bad. I've seen it done to other people I care about, and I was powerless in the moment. Um 
So what about that, though? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's like, I, I don't want to be a perpetrator. I don't want to continue that cycle. I don't, I, that's probably an underlying, that's a good question, to be honest. I, I'm trying yeah, to actually, It's an underlying what? Uh, of not wanting to continue that, of trying to be a good person. Because if I want to be honest, there's an underlying, I don't give a shit. So it's that in between, but I'm I'm really trying to be on the other side of that. Why? Why are you making that choice instead of staying with I don't give a shit? Because I want to be a good person. I want to have a fulfilling life. I want to be I want to be happy, right? And if you're if you're being vile, you're not going to be happy. You're going to die alone or die early. That's that's the outcome. Yeah. That is the true outcome. I want yeah. to be a good person. Is being vile, does that seem like it represents the truth of you? A half truth. Tell me about that. <laughs> because, I mean, doing the right thing is boring. <laughs> but it's the right thing, right? I mean, you have to do it or else you, do, you, you don't get what you want. You don't have a happy, fulfilling life. If you don't... I mean, you can bend the rules. You can play in between for, for a lot of it, but sometimes you have to play on the right side. And sometimes you can't play on the other side. But for the most part, you have to be on the right side of it. Or else well, just shit hits the fan, everything falls apart. That's the cycle of it. Okay. So, so part of you thinks that the reason why you stay on the right side is because that's the easiest thing. Or the right thing. I mean, I don't... I, okay, so hang on. I don't want to go down that train of thought. I want to cap it. My actions okay. are true, right? If I if I go down that 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 thinking, uh, I will overthink it, and I will just play into the other side. Hmm. That's that that's my that's my uh, resolution on that one. Because if I continue down that damn road, yeah, you can do that, whatever. But sometimes it's 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 better not to be the smartest person in the room. It, and just it, cap it and be done with it. So you, to, I I want to cap it with you. Just let me know what what the capping is. We're just capping like the rightness and wrongness discussion. Sure. Okay. Um, the morality of it. So if like like okay, so like if I think this is the best choice, not only for me, but um, it's the right choice maybe for someone else too. Like say that let, let let's say that um someone want, and I'm in a relationship with someone and I'm codependent, and they want to change me and I want to make sure they're happy, right? Because uh -huh. I was in a relationship like this in the past. It's not right for them to try to change me, and it's not right for me to be unhappy because then I'm going to be resentful. I'm going to have contempt, right? I mean, it's going right? to be it's going to happen. I'm going to have an external uh psychopathic traits that are going to be elevated, or whatever. Right. So yeah. I need to exit and cap it right that makes sense exit the relationship and cap it yeah okay i'm or gonna like I'm... yeah go ahead Shit. or else I... what <laughs> or, or else i'm i'm just gonna go down that spiral route of destruction right i'm gonna be yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna numb my feelings i'm gonna get you know i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that it, that's where i was mm -hmm. um it's 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 crazy because uh when i made my position better when I realized that what I can control is make myself and put myself in a better position, a lot of my uh, traits kind of lessened. They're still there, right? But yeah. a lot, a lot of the the destructive, overtly destructive, wanting to go, you know, n you know, fuck shit up and and because I'm bored, lessened. Yeah. And I was able to think clearly. I was able to um, to do things better. Right. I was able to to cap impulses. I was able to control myself in this way. I was able to maintain this and not quit that. A lot of that lesson. And mm -hmm. and I realized that, wow, okay. Um, if I just fix the underlying issue and resolve that instead of mm. doing all these other bullshit things to distract me from actually dealing with the problem, then here we go. Things just started to get better. It was hard. Everything's hard, but yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. I wonder, um, I wonder if I'll, I'll let you kind of know, like the way that I kind of see my own self a little bit. And I'm curious, like if you can, if that describes something that you've experienced ever or not, if, if that's okay. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'd love to hear. Uh -huh. So, uh, 
uh, one thing that I've kind of like learned, you know, because I think when I first went to therapy, uh, I had a Mormon therapist and he, he asked me, he's like, are you okay with us? You know, like using Mormon concepts, like Mormon scriptures or, or whatever. So he had me read. And if, if anybody's interested, you can look this up in the book of Mormon. There's a chapter in the book of Mormon. It's called Moroni seven chapter seven. You can read this. And he's like, yeah, read this. And then let me know what you think or whatever. And in it, it says something kind of like, and people that do evil, you know, are, are kind of by their nature evil. Like this is a really rough paraphrase and this is for sure how I interpreted it at the time, but then kind of, uh, you know, have like different thoughts on it now, although I can see from the language, <laughs> the stuff at the time. And then it, it kind of said, you know, kind of like, uh, God being kind of good, he, he can only kind of bear forth good fruits. Like good people can only bear forth good fruits and like bad you know a bad tree only bears forth like bad fruits kind of things you know like kind of connecting like this this idea of like if um i don't know like if if you kind of have enmity i guess like in your heart you know then then you will express that enmity what was the the where you use, you'll externalize it in yeah. your actions kind of that's that's now how i see it but at the time i was like but I have done bad things. Therefore I'm bad. <laughs> That's how I understood it when yeah. I read it. And he was like, no, go back and read it again. And like, that was like my homework for like six months of therapy. And I was like, I still do not understand this chapter. And I'd like come in again and be like, yeah. And I, I continue to interpret it this way. And he'd be like, okay, another week or whatever. That's like basically how it kind of went, but it's because in my mind, I, I think I kind of got hung up over the terminology of like bad, good, you know, evil, good again, I guess, like light, dark or something. And I I, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, I've done these bad things. I know I've done bad things. I don't want to be like come into therapy and think, OK, I haven't done bad things or something, you know, and now you're my therapist is kind of telling me I'm a bad person for having done these bad things. <laughs> Okay, I've been, I've been in that position. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, if that's what's happening. <laughs> sure, fine. You know, I'm like game because I'm like desperate to get better in a way. Right. You know, I'm desperate to like stop the cycle of, of which I feel kind of like I'm just stuck. You know, uh, but mm -hmm. eventually I started kind of using like a different uh, terminology, and I would ask myself like situations like, is this a sustainable thing? So, for instance. Yeah, sustainable or unsustainable, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I'm so, like, big on that. Absolutely. I yeah. agree with you 100%. Like what you gave kind of me a hypo about you're in a relationship with somebody that you're codependent with and they, they want to change you and, you know, that that's not a right thing. No. Or that that's the thing too. This is right way or wrong way or something, but not like right in the morality well, way. Kind of more just rightness in like this, uh, you know, like using the correct grammar is right. There's no, there's no kind of like bad or good about it. There's just like, oh, you have correctly used this word or you have incorrectly mm -hmm. used well, it, you know? If you want to be cynical about it, like, I mean. Who wants people... to be cynical? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I love okay. irony. Okay. Or in stuff like... All right. But, uh, but, but also it's like, if you look at it, like the good and evil thing, um, you can really dissect it and see like which side of you're on, right? So if you, if I you don't really agree. want to, oh, oh okay. Yeah. So like, I can really pick at this and say like, you know, um, if you look at a lot of like, um, as a nation, as America, a lot of actions that our military has taken, right. Invading the wrong countries for the wrong reasons or whatever, but in the name of God, and this is truth and whatever, and you can justify it this way or that way. And then no, um, a lot of those actions were unjust and, and, and potentially evil. Right. Or, or you can say that like the greater good for this decision cost, you know, these people amount of lives, but that was evil, but no, no, it saved, you know, a lot of these, these people, uh -huh. that's probably good. Right. I don't know. People still died. You can, it's definitely so. Okay. So full disclosure, uh, I'm in, I'm in marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's definitely how you persuade people and you force that perspective and um, being in this sort of sector. Uh, I love persuading people to give up their contact details for the sales team to close. So <laughs> that's my job. Uh, I love it. Get a rush every time it happens. Uh, but knowing that aspect of life, propaganda, marketing, whatever, the, whatever you want to spin it and the way people will chew it and eat it and settle on it is the how it's going to happen. That's my cynicism, hmm. right? Okay. But, <laughs> 
I, I, I can see you disagreeing, but um, I, I do try to be an optimist and say that, yes, this, this action was just, yeah, this is that. Um, because, because of all that, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be able to live with your actions or live with yourself or even accept what happened there, right? So, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't agree with your moral dichotomy mm, <laughs> that okay. there exists like this moral dichotomy. And I, you know, I, I it's, it's not like uh, I'm saying you're wrong. I just don't experience my own life that way. And it, you I can tell me I'm wrong. And no, I no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely will try to prove you wrong. <laughs> well, this is something too that, you know, like uh, I've maybe noticed. So I'm on the cusp. I think they call it like the Oregon Trail generation. I'm like the uh, cusper of like uh, Gen X and and the millennials. Okay. Yeah, Gen Y. Yeah, the millennials. And one thing I've noticed kind of with the millennials is like, uh, like, because I have, you know, relatives or friends or so, or whatever who are millennials, is there's almost like a preoccupation with morality that I just don't experience with the Gen X people I know, <laughs> where it's like things, you're a bad person or you're a good person, you know, and that that's what I'm kind of like a little bit curious where that's coming from. That's coming from my upbringing and my uh, okay. raised religion. So right. I was raised Seventh Day Adventist. Okay. And they're kind of extreme with the immorality. Um, <laughs> to where like, oh no, that's evil. That's a defined evil. Or no, this is a defined good. And uh -huh. so that's how like I can categorize categorize that. I could get into the, the tweeds about it, and I can logic my way no out. No need. Of I mean, I just well, you know we. Well, I do want to state this, like I can logic my way out of any morality if I wanted to and right. say, no, this was just because of this. I could do yeah. that, but I choose to cap it because at that point, I'm just going to logic my way out of responsibility. Well, I think it's really interesting, you know, I, through my own experience, kind of understood that there were certain concepts that were not useful to me because they were not, they were so prone to my manipulation, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do know. So, so things like <laughs> the way that I used to use, I don't know, good or bad, like I don't use those words anymore. And I think one of the reasons why is because maybe I was, that they, those concepts cease to be kind of like, it's almost like you stretch out, like you probably don't have the same sorts of spandex swimming suits I have, but like when you stretch it out too far, then it, it no longer performs its function. It's just like, <laughs> does not adhere okay. to you, whatever. And so the same thing with like good and evil. It's like I had stretched those concepts so much and kind of like played with them so much that they that they didn't have like any real meaning to me. They don't. But, yeah, but good and evil, you know, as used by other people, like there, there's there's something that those words are getting at, even if we don't use those words. Right. And that's what I guess I kind of started to understand is I don't have to use the words of this Moroni seven. I don't have to think of these things in this way, but I can use words that make sense to me that are not capable of my distortion. Like they're okay. not easily susceptible to me manipulating them. And so okay. that's why I've started using these words like sustainable or unsustainable. I, and you know, I, like, and I do, I use, I use those words. Um, oh, you if, do? Yeah, I do. I do. Absolutely. I use unsustainable, sustainable, but um, I also view it as minimizing collateral damage. If I really, if I really want to look at it, like at its core, it's minimizing collateral damage as best as I can for my actions. Mm -hmm. And that's Sustain very, what is it? Utilitarian Jeremy sure. Bentham or whatever to minimize. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, yeah. It can be. Yeah. It's interesting because I started to understand like in therapy really, and maybe it was from reading the same chapter in Moroni <laughs> over and over again for like six months. But I started to understand that even if I didn't have like a morality per se or something, or, you know, like I had kind of like, you know, it was like maybe the way I learned it was too like en engrossed or too kind of like saturated in hypocrisy, you know, that I could not, <laughs> I could not really understand it. You know, like my, my parents <laughs> being hypocrites, yeah. my yeah. The religious leaders, yep. I was exposed to being hypocrites. The, but I tried to kind of understand and like just describe like my own aesthetic. What is my aesthetic? Like I I've heard you use the word just and unjust. Like and I realized like I do have an aesthetic for fairness, sure. But even more than that, I have an aesthetic for efficiency. 
that if I had to sacrifice one over the other, that I would actually think, yeah, fair, sure. But efficiency is is the more important thing. Do I you have anything like that? I don't believe in fairness. I don't. Okay. Well, first, tell me how you define fairness. Sacrificing something for another thing, almost. I mean, if if you look at fairness, it's like you're giving up. Someone's giving up something to, for the for for it to be an equal balance or something like that to be fair. Really, that's how you define fairness. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow. Okay, that's not at all how I would define fair. <laughs> okay. I mean, we do have probably different lived realities when it comes to fairness in that word. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because in my law school. The one of my professors or kind of somebody, this was like the lore, I kind of don't remember anymore. They're like the only four letter word you can't use at this school is the word fair, <laughs> because it is it is their point was it's so so many people have different ideas about what it means. And that's why I think it's an interesting question to ask people. <laughs> what that does is, fairness that is a, mean to that you? That is a good question. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that's giving up some because when someone says, well, we need to be fair, I'm giving up mm. something. I'm giving up this for that. Yeah, no, I'm okay. compromising. That's what so, we're, tr we're really trying to say here. Here's what I usually think is the definition of fair is that you get what you deserve. That's my definition of fair. Isn't that weird to you? That is weird because if I worked hard for something and I deserve this and I'm being fair, I'm compromising and sacrificing a bit of my efforts and my fruits of my labor. No, screw you, guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you get what you deserve. That's fair. That's that's the fairness or whatever. So I don't know. Nope. I, so that's what, <laughs> when I say, like, I, I, I think efficiency uh, supersedes fairness. I guess that's what I kind of mean is like, even though. I think you know, we're agreeing I'm, on the same thing, to be honest, just using different terminology. No, I think your, your definition of fairness is basically my definition of efficiency, maybe, or something. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I think we're agreeing on the same thing. Just, just different ways of, we're taking different paths to get to the same uh, destination, to be honest. Which is what, what's the destination you think we're at? Uh, I don't know. I was trying to come up with a clever analogy to make myself seem intelligent, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot here. Shit. I don't know. <laughs> well, like, do you, do you, are we going to the same destination? I was going to say, Maybe. you know, like oh. normally I think, okay, you, I, you grew these carrots, you get these carrots or whatever. But sometimes I think, oh, okay, now we're you talking grew about these... communism. <laughs> are we? Yeah. We're never, not, never, no, you're going to take my carrots. I grew them. Nah, nah, nah. I'm a well, capitalist. sometimes for efficiency, uh -uh. I think, okay, you grew these carrots, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I, you know, grew these chickens. So let's make the soup <laughs> because the chickens plus the carrots is equal. Like, I understand that, that like kind of efficiency. Yeah. Okay. I still, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not pro compulsion. So that's where I, I I'm not communist, whatever you thought there was. I, I, no, I, I was, I was joking. I was, no, it was, it was, it was, it was just a joke. I, yeah. I don't know. But sometimes, I mean, fairness, like sometimes often we get more than we deserve. You know, I was born in the United States. Did I deserve to be born in the United States and just like enjoy all the rights and privileges of no? Did you, did that, you make that's that not choice? fair. Did you make that choice? I don't know that if I made that choice. Did you make the choice of being born as a woman in the United States, as a white woman in the United States? Did you make that? You choice? know, actually, Mormons do believe that you make the choice to be born. But I don't know if it was to be a white woman in the United States. Yeah, I'm white. You I know, so I'm, I'm glad a woman. I, was not born I have like all these guilt. things that are not fair or whatever. <laughs> oh, know? my God. If OK, so if I was raised with that mentality that, yes, you made this choice. So you need to, like, accept this. I mean, like, oh, hell no, guy. What? What? No, I did not choose to be born in this position, in this in this family, in this place as this ethnicity, gender and whatever. So you can mm. screw off with that. No, okay. I, I I will not be apologetic for where I came from or who I am. I mean, you got to be kidding me. I mean, now we're just regressing at that point, in my opinion, um, because I had no control over that. I had no <laughs> I had no determination of like where I was going to be in my desk or destiny, quote unquote. Right. So, mm -hmm. no. I, I, I'm going to reject that outright with all. All right. Dudes. So you disagree. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on that one. Sure. I, respectfully. Um, yeah, like, wow. Course. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's, that is, that is insane. I didn't know. Like, I'm sorry. That, that sort of thinking just goes against a lot of like, of like what I believe uh, at a core almost that okay. I, I, okay. So what I'm saying is like, I've, I've never been introduced to that sort of thinking. And this is new to me, and I'm kind of just processing it as we're talking. Yeah, no problem. Um, but, I mean, Mormons don't necessarily believe that you chose, like, a specific okay. thing. They just mean that you chose to come to this earth and get a body. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the specifics are. Maybe we we had more influence or more choice or something than other things. Okay. I can tell like like if I had like some sort of like like youth leader explain this concept uh, to me as a child. As a child, I probably would have told him in the most polite way to go fuck himself. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. I remember I was like maybe like maybe ten, and I asked uh, like this pastor, this youth leader, say, so like you know like when you pray, why do you never hear God? Why does he never you know talk to you back? He said, well you know God talks to you in different ways, the whole like mysterious ways thing. And I look at him and say, well, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. That that doesn't no. That doesn't compute. That, that I I don't I don't understand this. If I if I'm supposed to have a relationship with this being, and it's a one sided conversation, that sounds more like like a one sided relationship, in my opinion. And in, in my 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 opinion, so it's like, uh, no. So that's kind of started me down the path of 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 rejecting all sort of notions of a higher being. Okay. Um, so I, I don't want to get like all neck beard in the whole logic of like atheism because I don't even like talking about that. Um, but it's hard for me to understand that that there is a higher being controlling a lot of this when there's a vast universe, right? And there's a lot more things to be doing. You know what I mean? Micromanaging. Oh, I think it, Mormonism yeah. doesn't believe that God created the universe. The Mormon God didn't create the universe. He just created okay. this earth. That's fair. Um, yeah. <laughs> whichever, whichever way, um, this earth, I, which is a simulation. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I could probably lean closer to that or an alien ant farm, but, yeah. um, the Prometheus route, but I, I, I choose to believe nothing or the lack of belief of nothing because I take solace in the fact that when I die, there is nothing. So I live life to the fullest and, and, and what I can do right now. Right. Because if, if I do believe that there is a, a Garden of Eden, or I'm sorry, a heaven at the end of this, or a hell, whatever, if I believe there's a heaven that's going to be bliss and everything, then why put in any effort, right, in this moment other than the bare minimum to get there? Mm -hmm. That's my my perception of it. So if I, I can't reconcile logically that there is something, so, I mean, if there is nothing, then that's better because I can just do what I can the best I can right now. Yeah. It gives me motivation. I like it. God, I mean, I, sorry, I didn't mean to go on this stupid rant, but. No, it's, but I, <laughs> I am going to flag for you because I, and, uh, you know, we, uh, people who are maybe going to listen, uh, in 20 minutes, I have to leave because the sun sets. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. I yeah. need to uh, take a break, but. Oh, no, you need fair. to take a break now? Well, no, 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 no. In twenty minutes. Oh, in twenty minutes, perfect. Well, whenever, right. whenever you're taking a break, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll do that too. Um, okay, but... sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, with these twenty minutes, what do you think? What should we talk about? I mean, the conversations your oyster, Miss Emmy Thomas. How do you tell me? What do you want to talk about? What do you want to know about me? Uh, I mean, you can share share what 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 you're interested in or anything okay i mean what i'm interested in is definitely wow um that's a good question because that varies week day month year to be honest um the only thing that's constant with me if, if i were to think about it is is my relationships uh my best friend 17 years um, I have another good friend who introduced me to my best friend, 17 years, my, my siblings, my parents, um, my previous relationship, uh, 13 years. Um, so I'm like, when it comes to relationships, that's probably the constant in my life out of that's everything. Nice. Jobs, I change every three or four years, maybe careers, um, interests, sure. Maybe every other month, week, whatever. I don't care. Whenever I'm get bored, I just ditch it, go to the next one. But that's probably the only constant in my life is that connection. the relationships yeah yeah because yeah. that's that's the one thing i i don't know i unconsciously or consciously chose to be uh, sacred and then hold dear yeah i mean I, that's probably 
I mean, I like video games. I like uh, cringy video games because, uh, I mean, like, if you're a psychopath, you probably would fucking love them. <laughs> but <laughs> I like Call of Duty because of the constant uh, action. I love Rainbow Six Siege because of the cold calculation and the adrenaline it gives. And I love Hunt Showdown because it's terrifying. Uh, you don't know when you're going to be hunted and you like and you, and you can hunt other people. And it's always fun. I mean, cringy, <laughs> you know, like, quote unquote. I love that game. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be- definitely break the, the 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 psycho character there because you could be completely goofy, right? So you're hiding in a bush with a knife, okay? And then there's uh-huh. some guy who's on edge that runs by another player, right? He's on edge. He's he's just looking at every corner, and you just jump out of the bush and go ooga booga booga booga. You can visibly see their character freak out. And they don't know how to aim and hit you. So they're all shooting and they're trying to run from you and you get them with a knife and you're like, ah, you loser. It's so funny. Like, like the dude. Can you say light. Ooga Booga? Like, yeah, what's yeah. the uh, you, you Yeah, can. you can do whatever you want. I, I love to scream absurdities because it's, it's just, it's hilarious because everyone is tense. There's zombies. There's like giant mutant spider creatures that come at you. There's hellhounds. Like the whole thing, the whole game is tension, 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 terrifying tension. You're being hunted. You're being watched the whole time. And I'm here not taking it seriously in a bush as a half naked mm-hmm. bushman coming out with a knife going Ooga Booga Booga Booga, ah, just being all stupid and goofy. And the, the 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 whole absurdity of it freaks them out. It's hilarious. Sometimes you hear them scream on mic, and mm-hmm. they're like this this man just screaming like a little child, or or you see them visibly freak out because of the sensitivity of their mouse or whatever. And it's hilarious. Sometimes I I I, I I'm just laughing the whole time because of it, because of the whole absurdity, the absurdity yeah. of it. I, I love it. Um, I love this for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun it's so fun and it's so cringy it's it, like if you saw me doing it you would cringe like crazy but i, I love it i, I love don't it. cringe oh, that's good to know <laughs> 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 but um yeah i i just find it hilarious it's 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 uh part of that, that humor thing i like i guess the the um the irony of it everyone mm. else is like you know being all tense and freaked out and i'm just sitting here in the bush being a happy retard about to jump out in the sky being all tense <laughs> Do you think one of the reasons why you like irony is because you like to see as much of the truth as you can, even yeah, if it's not yeah. consistent? Yeah, uh, sure. I, it's yeah. I mean, it's 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 almost maddening in a way if you really want to get into it. And and it's that 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 fracture that I kind of gravitate towards if I want to mm. keep a constant theme. Right. It's it's that truth of 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 something almost being in complete madness that's that's also calming and and has clarity and it's not maddening the i you know if you think of irony it, it's it's kind of it if you really look at something like a like like a like a situation that's ironic you're like whoa okay that's kind of kind of weird you know especially depending on how it is it can be it can be kind of maddening and uh, i kind of find the humor in that but yeah the the underlying truth of something the the uh, dichotomy right maybe is it like, how do you feel about people who refuse to see, you know, the irony, I guess, like, are, Ooh, well, I love those people because Yo, you get, love them. I get to, I get to flaunt it in their face in subtle ways until they get it. And I'm like, ha, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll be an ass. I'll be a troll. And I, I'll, I'll present it to them in, in subtle ways and overt ways until they get it. And then I'll just dance around them until they get it. And it's funny. <laughs> well, uh, what, what pleasure do you get? <laughs> Out of like helping them to understand reality, is it kind of like, oh, you you tried not to see this, and now I'm showing you it, or sure, yeah, maybe oh. maybe a, a god complex or duper's delight, whatever the situation calls for. But yeah, I love that. I absolutely love it. I love it, especially when someone goes on this whole monologue on how they hate this thing, and I'll just like reply, maybe ironic, because you just became the thing that you just said you hated. I just mm-hmm. say ironic, and then. Either they get that because that's like the most overt way of saying that because it's simple and it's and it's like whatever, or they don't. But I find it I find it palpable. Yeah. The best form of humor for me is irony. But uh, the is it because you you enjoy like the tension that other people experience, or you enjoy the tension of the concepts themselves, both. or something else? No, both definitely oh, really? both. Yeah, uh, when when you when you said uh, both of those, yeah, no, they both resonated with me. The tension that it creates, and also the uh, the uh, unraveling that I'm doing in my mind to understand it. It's it's very feel, stimulating. 
yeah when you do you experience the tension of irony too but you just you think you experience it in a pleasurable way and oh, other people man. experience it in a non-pleasurable yeah. way yeah yeah i love it when i find myself being ironic because i'm like huh huh how about that okay cool yeah wow okay that's a learning experience but but also yeah when i when i force it on someone too you know my, their mind is my toy in a way <laughs> uh there's that um but I mean, I don't try to be completely, completely destructive with it, right? Yeah. Right. So, I, I'm just that's just me having fun, me being big brother. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, big brother, little brother, teasing. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, it's the absurdity in that too. Like, um, I find that with absurd humor, usually there's an underlying hum of of irony with it. Um, so and that's that's you, where it's it's funny. You've used the word absurd uh, a couple times. What what does absurd mean to you? Something that doesn't make sense. That's so like okay. So you think of like a, like Adult Swim humor almost. If I if I really want to like say it as like or or you something that we call YouTube poop, <laughs> for lack of okay. a better term. Something so stupid and so like out of it, it's just like out of nowhere that it's so stupid. Um, almost like it's an acid trip sometimes, or even like. I don't know. Sometimes, but when you really process it, like, oh, that could, that's kind of ironic in a way, or 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 it so breaks reality that it's so funny. Uh, it breaks reasons. reality. Yeah, you know that's funny because I also like stuff to like intentionally disorder things mm -hmm. in like unexpected ways. Like because my it's mom. Not boring. Yeah, my mom makes fun of me or will kind of joke like if we're like driving in the car or something, I'm listening to the radio and I start singing a harmony. Mm -hmm. uh i'll just choose like an <laughs> interval and stick to that interval even though it goes out of the key or whatever so it just sounds mm -hmm. like <laughs> total nonsense <laughs> you know what i what i like to do is um say my own lyrics like... oh yeah i love that too and my girlfriend <laughs> when i start doing it she's like do we need a different song oh man <laughs> She knows I'm soothing my brain by just kind of mm -hmm. being like saying these crazy things about chickens, chicken Absolutely. farm. <laughs> and now they can't unhear it. And they're like, thanks, you just ruined this for me. And I'm like, well, yeah. you're welcome because I love the fact that I just ruined it for you because it's funny as hell. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I get that. I do. Um, and actually, there's that's, that conversation was brought up in one of your your, your communities that um, that music. Uh, yeah, that, Discord. That, that seems, that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that's a that's a common theme because uh I love producing music that's not necessarily traditional. It's more of mm. like an aesthetic, um, maybe a push pull rhythm of tension or even um something that's just so yeah imperfect. Yeah. Um. That's the one tension. Thing that, yeah. Mm. Yeah. The one thing that that I gravitate towards electronic music a lot is because it's so cold and robotic that you have to make it sound human you know like 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 a human produced it by introducing artificial imp imperfections interesting you have to give it a swing you have to take it off you know the timing a little bit or you have to <laughs> induce some sort of distortion or saturation to make it sound less robotic and less perfect uh -huh. you, you have and but when you're playing an instrument you have to do the inverse you have to be perfect so it's the opposite of that yeah. That's what I love about electronic music and how I can resonate with it um, is because you have to make something so perfect imperfect and that, chaotic. That's interesting. I learned this about like when they were trying to uh, come up with synthesized strings mm -hmm. is that they were having a hard time having it sound realistic, yep. like especially a string section. And then they, they learned that the thing, exactly what you said, you had to introduce imperfections, that a real string section you can tell uh, their strings is because they're playing slightly out of tune with each other yep. you know so they're stacked on top of each other playing out of tune and so that's what you had to do to in order to recreate the sound of a live string section yes if you um yes if you look at a lot of amateur musicians who are going into the electronic scene um and listen to the music yeah a lot of it sounds a little bit off key or whatever because they don't understand tempo or or measures or anything like that but they're also too perfect it sounds mm. robotic and like, you know, this tune, that tune, literally in sequence. It sounds like someone just threw it in a sequencer. Yeah. Um, as you mature as an electronic musician, you learn to be more human with it. Introduce this, introduce that. And it kind of forces that creativity out by that constriction. 
and mm -hmm. that's where I find the, the, the most creativity coming out is when you have those restrictions. Because you have to like, okay, this sounds too stupidly perfect and it's lame, so I have to like detune it, throw it through some sort of weird compression and distortion and punish yeah. the sound and distort it and it comes out as something so beautifully corrupt. I love it. And do you think that the way, this is a total out there question, feel free to skip it. <laughs> do you no, feel no, like sure. the way that you live your life is more like the live string section in which your your imperfections are in some ways like actually the qualities that make you beautifully human? Or do you feel like you are like the synthesizer that's trying to imitate this and you're intentionally introducing like little human flaws <laughs> in order to imitate something that you aren't? I would say that my artistic expression is definitely an externalization of my internal self. So I would say that I feel too robotic and I have to imitate imperfection. Interesting. Thank you for that question, because that was very <laughs> introspective and something I've never thought to actually think about. I appreciate that. Now that's going to be uh, in my head for months. Thank you for that. That Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I really am curious to hear, you know, if you uh, if you think about it, because I... I do like messing up my routines. I do like introducing a little bit of chaos. So yes. Yeah. yeah, no, that would make sense of how I'm externalizing myself through my artistic expression in that way and mm -hmm. how I relate to it and how I gravitate towards it. That makes a lot of sense, to be honest. Yeah. And um, like the, you're you're doing it for an effect too, you know, like you're making these small changes. So mm -hmm. like it sounds less robotic less robotic i guess like less, less perfect less yeah less boring less boring mm -hmm. that's interesting Boredom. it's very um like um what what do we say auteur you're like an auteur <laughs> kind of of your life you're like a um you you treat it like it's like a palette a little bit so someone once expressed to me that they feel like um, a lot of bees in a suit as a human. Mm, interesting. So for me, um, when I when they were talking about that and I was being introspective, I feel more like, and this is going to sound so cringy and stereotypical, but my own puppet master in a way. Mm. In, in a suit. Like I'm pulling my own strings, trying to do this, do that. When it comes to emotions and feelings, if I'm really thinking about it, I feel like it's a Swiss army knife and I'm trying to just plug this in here, plug this in there. Um, is this working? Is this not working? Um, am I going to put this on hold? Um, and <laughs> it's, it's very interesting, to be honest, if you really look at it, and I try not to think about it, because when I start thinking about it, then I go back to that perfect sound. And I mm. want to distort it, I want to saturate it, I want to give it more of a life and a flair and not think about that. Have you ever thought about like musically or with your life, like incorporating actual uh, acoustic sounds into your compositions, like just getting the string section, you know, just playing the strings? Um, yeah, um, I can barely play the guitar. I can play the piano a little bit. Um, we you talking about playing an instrument. If I were to pick an instrument and really commit and actually have that sort of passion and ex externalization it would probably be drums mm, just nice. beating away at a beat beating away at a beat just, just going at it having fun and uh, and and providing that rhythm i so if i look at the spectrum of sound i resonate with the low end mm. uh the drums the bass the the where the emotions really coming out you know like that's driving the sound um, that's where I resonate. So it's either going to be bass and bass music or distortion and, and carrying that, or if it's going to be in live sound, it's going to be in percussion and drums. Mm -hmm. That's where I would resonate. Nice. Yeah. How about you? Uh, well, I used to... I used to, uh, what my therapist would say, orchestrate, which is funny since we're talking about music. He's like, you're orchestrating everything. You know, every day you're orchestrating things. And like, doesn't that get exhausting, you know, to constantly be 
<laughs> tweaking little things to make it sound authentic rather than just be authentic. It does. How do you... Okay, so I actually... When you're... Off... Okay, so... Huh. Huh. That's actually quite interesting. I found that when you're your most authentic self, you're your most vulnerable. You mm. let those walls down. And you be vulnerable. You be genuine. Because when you're vulnerable, you are not being insecure. You're not thinking about what you look or how you look or what you're presenting in front of the person in front of you. You're being vulnerable. You're being true to yourself. And that that really shines. Yeah. And um, that's where I see when all that dissipates. The, the puppeteering, the controlling is when you truly are your vulnerable self. And that is hard. That is very hard to do because you open yourself up to being hurt from that lived experience of your past traumas and all of that. And I can only do that with people I care about who I want to have a relationship with. Um, and that is what it is. So like my, my, my friends, my family, my siblings, um, when I can establish those, those connections, I can only be my true self and vulnerable with. And, and when I'm saying that, though, I, I'm also uh, being contradictive because I am being vulnerable with you. So and <laughs> to be authentic and honest, right? Well, awesome. I love that you have, you know, the these relationships that you can be authentic. And that's awesome. It is refreshing um, because when I'm at work, you know, it's whatever. It's, it is exhausting, to be honest. Sometimes I even have to take literal naps because of it. You know, like I'll find myself. Yeah. Why am I tired? Oh, because I was putting on this whole showboat the whole day. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. it it is exhausting, and I hate I hate it when I recognize that it is what it is for. Um, because I'll find myself taking like Adderall or or oh like four hundred milligrams of caffeine and doing all these nootropics just to keep up with the facade. And I'm like, oh yeah. no, that's 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 maladaptive. I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Literally taking speed to keep up with with some bullshit that I've dealt with because of genetics and trauma or something. Yeah, um, but it is what it is. Yeah, maybe you can see that it's getting dark where I am. Oh, I have to yeah, go I... see the sunset. Right. No. <laughs> but thank some, you so much for chatting with me. I would love to chat with you again sometime. This has been really great. I really appreciated it. Absolutely. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No problem. Do you have any closing thoughts or anything? No. Um, I, I, I no just pressures. <laughs> well no pressure but pressure yeah but thank you for having me i appreciate it i'm a big fan i did love your book i wish i got to talk a little bit more about where it resonated with your with your book but uh, maybe that oh yeah for the next time sounds good okay good yeah, i yeah. always love having an excuse because i i hate goodbyes yes ma'am me too <laughs> all right you have right. a good night miss thomas until later